or accelerate. It is truly my pleasure to welcome you all here this evening for this seminar on PEP or uh, post-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, th this again would not have been possible without the support of USAID and PEPFAR, so thank you for your support. I think many of you are aware that since the first cases of HIV were identified in India way back in 1986, India has actually done a, a fantastic job of responding to the pandemic uh, within the country. And right now, our population prevalence is about 0.2%. And I think many of you are also aware that treatment as prevention or combination antiretroviral therapy as a prevention strategy is probably one of the most efficacious tools that we have globally, and there's enough evidence around this. But I think the other thing to also be very cognizant of and very aware of is in most epidemics or pandemics, it's always easy to take care of that first, say, 60 or 70 percent in that reduction. But once you get at that 60 or 70 percent saturation, getting it all the way to the 95, 95, 95 takes a lot more effort than just a unipronged strategy. And I think that's where the role of pre-risk exposure prophylaxis and post-exposure prophylaxis fits in. So many of you may be aware, as part of Accelerate, we run a web platform called Save Zindagi. So this is a virtual one-stop shop catering to populations within India, and it's primarily targeting the LGBTQIA plus communities. And so one of the so we have been starting quite a few people on PrEP on this platform where the whole thing happens virtually through virtual outreach workers. We've initiated PrEP for over a thousand people across this platform. But one issue many of our virtual outreach workers face on this platform is many of them get calls from clients after the fact that risk has already happened, asking, what do I do? I had an, I had an exposure last night where the condom broke or... I was under the influence of drugs and I forgot to use a condom and I think I may have been exposed to HIV. And I think that's where post-exposure prophylaxis fits in. In most settings, I think when we think about post-exposure prophylaxis, we always think about it in terms of occupational exposure. But there is a lot more of a movement towards non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis, especially after like high-risk events. And it's a very thin line between where post-exposure prophylaxis works versus where does event-driven prep work, if you can plan the event, versus where does routine prep work or oral post uh, pre-risk exposure prophylaxis. And to address some of these issues and clarify questions that we have from the different providers and from the communities, we have decided to start a series of webinars. And I think our first webinar was on Saturday where we did cover pre-risk exposure prophylaxis. And today we will be covering post-exposure prophylaxis, especially non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis. And we have experts here from USAID, from the AIDS Society of India, and from the Fenway Institute and Harvard Medical School who are here to address us and also take questions at the end. I think most of us also recognize that COVID has been really detrimental to most of our lives. But one thing COVID has done has given us Zoom. I think pre prior to COVID, such webinars would not have been possible. But now, because of Zoom, we actually are able to bring experts from across the world into your living rooms or wherever you are at home or wherever you are at work right now with your laptop. So that's something that we want to leverage going forward, especially because the HIV field has been evolving at such a rapid pace. The question really is, what are the key burning topics? What can we actually do in these series of webinars? So this is something we're hoping to have on a monthly basis or on a bi-monthly basis, depending on what the interest is from the audience. And we had a very successful um, session on pre-risk exposure prophylaxis last week where we had almost 100 attendees. And so we are looking for um, ideas and suggestions from the audience as well on key burning topics. So we can plan webinars around these topics, whether it's long acting PrEP or HIV viral hepatitis co-infection or PB or whatever it is. If you can give us a sense of what the burning issues are or, or needs are from the, uh, from the public and private sector in India, we're happy to organize these webinars to make sure that we bring everyone up to date on the latest evidence from all the international research conferences as well as publications. So without further delay, I will turn it on to, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to welcome Ms. Deepika Joshi, who is 
serves as the HIV division chief at USAID in the India Health Office. She brings over 20 years of expertise in policy, system strengthening, strategic information, epidemiology, and monitoring of HIV infection in India. She's also served as a leader and worked in a diverse array of stakeholders, including communities, multilateral organizations, international NGOs, the US CDC, and now she's at the USAID. But more than all that, she really is a good friend and a, a very strong supporter of HIV. And she's she, and the one thing that always strikes me about her is she's always willing to take that extra step to make sure that everyone has access to HIV uh, services in India. Thank you, Deepika, for joining us. Over to you to address us on 20 years of PEPFAR. What can we look forward to? Thank you so much, Sunil, for that warm welcome. And Deepika, I think what think you said about- um, We can hear you, yeah. Yeah, uh, can you hear me, Jalpa? Yes, you're audible, yes. Um, Sunil, can you hear me? Could be a little bit of lag. Um, Aditya, can you confirm if you can hear the pickup? Yes, I can hear you. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> great. Yeah, can you the pickup and see the pickup? Thank you, thank you, Sunil. And I just I was saying what you said for me is equally applicable to you. So it's a, it's really an honor and pleasure uh, to be uh, here today. And a very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you who have joined us for this webinar. Um, a very big thank you to uh, Team Accelerate for creating this avenue for uh, exchange of what I believe will be very enlightening insights into emerging advances in post-exposure prophylaxis. And you know this will be led by the illustrious speakers you will hear from shortly. And I think along the way, there's also going to be a healthy dose of programmatic and community level reality and challenges check-in that always need to be factored in uh, and navigated to truly look at a meeting ground for bringing uh, you know, the gamut of comprehensive combination prevention services to people who need them. Um, I am particularly delighted to have this opportunity today to share some thoughts about the genesis of, of this revolution called PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. Uh, in January 2003, the United States government launched PEPFAR, which is by far the largest commitment in history by any country to combat a single disease. And here we are 20 years later, looking back at PEPFAR's $100 billion investments in the fight against HIV AIDS, uh, which uh, have helped save or save over 25 million lives. Over 20 million people are receiving life-saving antiretroviral treatment as I speak. So we look back at a long winding road travel, uh, which was fraught with challenges, no doubt, but PEPFAR's transformative partnerships uh, with national and provincial governments, PLHIV and uh, KP communities, private sector partners, multilaterals, implementing partners, have really blazed through these impediments and demonstrated what uh, tremendous successes true partnerships can build. And I know many of us here today who have been associated with PEPFAR since its inception would have never believed in 2003 what a single commitment uh, is capable of, but here we are celebrating the success of PEPFAR at 20. And, and I take great pride in the fact that PEPFAR India has been able to successfully partner with government of India and key in-country stakeholders uh, to support a government-led, government-owned response, which has seen a decline of new infections by 46% and a decline of mortality by 76% against a global average of 32% and 52% respectively. So, you know, having said that, we all understand that this is not the time to be complacent. The greatest challenges to ending HIV AIDS as a public health threat by 2030 actually lie ahead. According to UNAIDS, 1.5 million people are still getting infected with HIV every year, and nearly 50% of those new infections are amongst women and girls. In 2021, more than 650,000 people still died from AIDS-related illnesses worldwide. And we all know that key populations bear the brunt of this disease. Outside of Sub-Saharan Africa, 94% of new infections in 2021 were amongst key populations. In India as well, while overall adult prevalence, as Sunil was telling us, is 0.21%, prevalence amongst FSW is nine times, amongst MSM 16 times, amongst transgender persons 18 times, and amongst people who inject drugs 43 times the adult HIV prevalence. So PEPFAR India is, uh, needless to say, committed to working with partners to close um, you know, such, such health equity gaps. Now, uh, as Sunil was saying, acknowledging a growing resounding evidence base 
uh, WHO guidelines recommend offering PrEP to those uh, that are at substantial risk of HIV infection uh, as an additional prevention choice within the basket of comprehensive prevention services. And you know, you've all spent a good couple of hours last weekend, as Sunil reminded us, uh, discussing the latest advances and their applicability to India. So all I will say is, and I will reiterate what Sunil said, is that in addition to PrEP, Post-exposure prophylaxis for HIV is an equally important tool for minimizing the risk of infection following potential exposure to HIV. Now, we all um, acknowledge that NACO's you know, progressive PrEP guidelines, which were released in 2021, which were collaboratively de uh, developed with inputs from all partners, including JHU, which closely supported uh, NACO in the drafting, they clearly mention the differentiation between occupational and non-occupational exposures to HIV, but we also understand that that is the first step towards acknowledging the importance of NPEP, and really a lot more needs to be done to bring focus on NPEP within the mainstream program and to operationalize those WHO guidelines for PEP to cover all types of potential exposures to HIV, and this includes, you know, unprotected sexual uh, intercourse, injection drug use, and, you know, sexual assault as well. So the Guidelines recommend that NPEP courses should be offered free of charge to everyone who meets the criteria. So PEP is not just an additional HIV prevention tool and a key component of a comprehensive HIV prevention package. It's also an essential component of the minimum package of post-violence clinical care services. And currently in India, NPEP is only available through private clinics, uh, except, of course, as I said, for victims of sexual um, uh, assault, as well as for people with occupational exposures. So a bottle of medication can cost anywhere between 2000 to 4000 or, you know, through NGOs or foundations where they are available, they are slightly more subsidized. And in our own experience under Project Accelerate's online portal, which is Saves in the Gain, Sunil was just talking about it. It offers services to a largely hidden population, and it has been reported by our team that there is a steady demand for PEP, which emerges during screening and counseling for PrEP. So, uh, uh, you know, many of you have heard about the use of psychoactive, uh, psychoactive drugs uh, before or during sexual activities to enhance pleasure to, you know, reduce inhibitions. It's called chemsex, high fun, and accelerate structured uh, interactions with clients practicing chemsex have revealed experiences of genital injuries, history of H HIV, STIs, rapes, and other physical injuries. And these results are also highlighting the necessity of integrating PEP within the comprehensive uh, you know, combination prevention response. So we at PEPFAR USAID continue to create an evidence base, which we hope will inform the national program, which is very well known for continually making strate strategic shifts in response to you know, emerging implementation science. So PEPFAR in its 20th year of implementation is dedicated to supporting partner government's ownership and vision towards achieving and sustaining near universal prevention and treatment coverage of HIV AIDS. And our partnership with the Johns Hopkins uh, uh, School of Medicine and its stellar team at Accelerate is really testimony to this commitment. On behalf of the PEPFAR uh, and USAID leadership, I want to thank our speakers from the Fenway Institute, ASI, USAID Office of HIV AIDS, and Johns Hopkins School of Medicine for taking the time today to share their knowledge and experience with us. And to all of you who have joined us today to listen, I'm really excited to partake in these discussions that will underscore the importance of PEP amongst high-risk populations as a critical component of any national HIV control strategy to drastically reduce new infections. So thank you all for this opportunity to speak with you today and back to uh, Sunil. Thank you, Deepika. We're looking forward to the PEPFAR commitment until we reach the 95, 95, 95, and even beyond HIV to other infectious diseases as well. It is next my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kevin Ard, who is the Medical Director um, of the National LGBTQIA Health Education Center at the Fenway Institute. The Fenway Institute, for those of you who don't know, is probably one of the best models of healthcare for the LGBTQIA community globally, and they're leaders in uh, training and replication of such models across the US and across the world. He's also the director of the Sexual Health Clinic at the Massachusetts General ha Hospital, which is part of uh, Harvard University. And he's a practicing physician and a faculty member of the Division of Infectious Diseases at MGH. Uh, he also serves as an assistant professor in the Harvard Medical School. And he's been collaborating with Accelerate right from the time we were awarded in 2019. So his interests include LGBTQIA health and the prevention of HIV and sexually transmitted infections among the LGBTQIA plus community. Over to you, Kevin, who's going to talk to us about integrating evidence from across the world to support 
non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis. Thank you very much, Sunil. It is great to be here today, and I um, am honored for the invitation to take part in this seminar. I'm going to share my screen. Um, so I'll be talking about integrating evidence to improve non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis uptake. Um, and I'll be providing some information um, and talk about our approach here in the United States and also here locally in Boston, Massachusetts, where I work, as well as other approaches around the country um, before turning things over um, to Dr. Coleman. So I'll say a bit about the evidence for NPEP. Um, we'll review some approaches to NPEP in the United States, including the regimens that are most commonly used and the typical baseline and follow-up monitoring of individuals who are prescribed NPEP. And we'll talk about strategies to increase, to increase NPEP access and uptake. Um, in comparison to the evidence base for pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP, um, the evidence base for NPEP is different. We don't have large randomized controlled trials. Um, uh, uh, because they're not thought to be feasible, feasible or ethical in the context of NPEP. Um, so we have really three different streams of evidence. Um, the first are animal studies. These were done many years ago, and they helped show that earlier initiation of NPEP is better than later. So as soon as possible after the exposure, the medication should be started. These also showed that 28 days are more effective than three days or 10 days. Um, and this has contributed to the standard NPEP course being 28 days. And these animal studies also showed the efficacy of tenofovir. And so in our context, tenofovir is a component of the first one. <clears throat> um, it says I'm muted. Are people able to hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, great. <clears throat> um, the second line of evidence comes from a case control study. This was not done in a non-occupational setting, but rather in an occupational setting. Um, and in this study in which healthcare workers had percutaneous exposures to HIV, they found that those who received zidovudine or AZT had a decreased risk of HIV infection by 81%. And so we anticipate that the three drug regimens we're using now are um, at least as effective as that 81% at preventing HIV infection. <clears throat> and then there are numerous observational studies of NPEP in clinical practice. Um, these are largely case series or case reports. Um, and so, um, you know, unlike a randomized trial, they're not able to definitively show the efficacy of NPEP. Um, but they do show that HIV acquisition in the context of NPEP provided soon after an exposure um, is rare. Um, one example is this study um, from Brazil of 200 men who have sex with men who were provided starter packs of NPEP with zidovudine and lamivudine within follow-on therapy for um, the full course um, after an exposure. And HIV occurred in 10 of 132 non-NPEP users but in just one of 68 NPEP users in that study. Um, there have also been several observational studies which have shown that um, the incidence of HIV is high in the months after NPEP usage. Um, these incident HIV infections are not thought to be due to NPEP failures, but rather reflect the fact that many people who are seeking NPEP are eligible for PrEP and also have an increased ongoing likelihood of HIV infection. I think this underscores the importance of thinking about transitioning to PrEP after a course of NPEP um, for people who, who um, uh, are initially prescribed NPEP. Um, so when is NPEP indicated? Um, well, in uh, our setting, the US guidelines say that it's recommended if there's a sexual or other mucosal or percutaneous exposure to infectious body fluids from a person living with HIV. Um, they say that it's indicated in a case-by-case -case fashion if there's an exposure such as that listed above, but the source individual's HIV status is unknown. And I would say that in clinical practice, these scenarios are the most common ones. Um, people are often seeking NPEP after a potential exposure to HIV, such as condomless sex or sex in which a condom broke, um, but the source individual's HIV status is not known and that individual is not available for testing. 
An NPEP is not recommended if someone presents more than 72 hours after exposure or if the uh, potential exposure confers a very negligible risk for HIV acquisition. <clears throat> the baseline evaluation for NPEP in our context includes a standard HIV test on the exposed person, ideally an antibody antigen test to allow for detection of early infection. Um, and then if possible, an HIV test on the source individual, but in most cases, that's not possible. We in our setting obtain a serum creatinine to assess renal function and liver enzymes, um, and also assess for hepatitis B and C, um, uh, given that those infections can travel along with HIV. And we can also provide prophylaxis for hepatitis B um, if the person is not immune. <clears throat> um, and in particular, if the source individual is known to have chronic hepatitis B infection. We do obtain a pregnancy test if the person could become pregnant. Um, and then for sexual exposures, we test for syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia. The gonorrhea and chlamydia testing, including assessments at all potentially exposed sites. These are really not to assess um, for infection from the um, most recent exposure, which um, you know, may have been a few hours previously, or certainly within the past three days, um, but simply for uh, the presence of baseline infection. Um, and I wanna outline though that um, NPEP is time sensitive. The sooner the medications are started, the better. And so um, in our setting, if there's any delay in obtaining the baseline laboratory studies, we don't wait to start the medicine. We simply start the medicine and then obtain the laboratory studies later as um, soon as possible. But beginning the medication is the most important step in preventing um, HIV. The recommended NPEP regimens in our context um, include um, uh, tenofovir desoproxyl fumarate emtricitabine or TDF FTC plus an integrase inhibitor, either raltegravir or dolutegravir for 28 days. I think most everyone uses the dolutegravir regimen um, because that is a once daily regimen as opposed to the raltegravir regimen, which is given multiple times a day. And there have been studies showing that people often forget that um, second daily dose of raltegravir. Why are these the regimens that are used? Um, well, a few reasons. One is um, the, um, the evidence um, showing the efficacy of tenofovir from animal studies. And the other is the potency and the excellent tolerability of the integrase inhibitor drug class. Um, so the dolutegravir there in this regimen. Um, we don't use NNRTI based regimens for NPEP. Um, and that's largely due to the fact that um, uh, transmitted drug resistance in HIV is most common for the NNRTI class. A potential alternative regimen is the combination of tenofovir desoproxyl fumarate emtricitabine with darunavir and ritonavir for 28 days. We generally don't use that. It's more pills um, and uh, greater potential for medication interactions. Of course, there may be special circumstances that affect the regimen choice. Um, for example, if the person has baseline renal dysfunction, say an estimated creatinine clearance less than 60 milliliters per minute, we would not use tenofovir desoproxyl fumarate. Um, the US guidelines, which are um, a bit old now, they were released in 2016, suggest using dose-adjusted zidovudine and lamivudine. Um, however, I think many of us at this time, um, if it's available, would use tenofovir alafenamide emtricitabine, which could be used down to a creatinine clearance of 30. Um, it is not common, but occasionally we learn that the source individual has drug-resistant HIV. And if information is available about um, their uh, resistance mutations, then we would tailor the NPEP regimen based on the source's genotype. This is very rare, but it does come up from time to time. Now, as I mentioned, um, this guidance is now uh, seven or so years old. And of course, HIV treatment has evolved since then. Um, uh, there have been studies looking at other regimens for PEP using um, more contemporary ART regimens, one of which is the combination of tenofovir alafenamide, emtricitabine, and bictegravir. This is a single tablet regimen, including an integrase inhibitor. And there was a study at the Fenway Institute. Um, this was an open label study of this regimen for NPEP at the Fenway Health Center. Um, the study involved 52 people, the majority of whom were men who have sex with men from 2018 to 2020. 
In general, this regimen was well tolerated. 15% of individuals reported nausea, 10% fatigue, 8% diarrhea. These are less common than in comparison to a historical control group. And 90% completed the 28-day regimen, um, also um, improved compared to a historical control group. And so, um, you know, more modern regimens than, and than those that are um, uh, indicated in the guidance may, um, may certainly be used for um, in PEP. This is one such example of a single tablet regimen that is well tolerated. Um, so what is the follow-up for the exposed person? Well, in our context, we repeat the HIV test after four to six weeks. Um, if there's been a sexual exposure, we also assess for syphilis and gonorrhea and chlamydia. We um, obtain pregnancy testing and then creatinine and liver enzymes are recommended to assess for um, drug side effects, although um, those are fairly uncommon. Um, and then at three months or at 12 weeks, we repeat the HIV antibody antigen test. Um, and in most scenarios, the person is then done with their follow-up monitoring for HIV. If that HIV test is negative, then we conclude they have not acquired HIV from that exposure. Um, I should mention um, that in the US right now, in people who have had antiretroviral exposure, um, it's recommended that we obtain an HIV RNA assay in addition to the standard HIV test to assess for HIV infection. So say if someone had been prescribed oral PrEP in the prior three months, but had stopped it um, and had an exposure to HIV, started NPEP, we would likely obtain, if possible, an HIV RNA assay as well. And the reason for that is um, studies showing that antiretroviral exposure can impact the um, performance of HIV test results. And so in people who've um, had oral antiretrovirals in the past three months, or injectable antiretrovirals in the past 12 months, we, if possible, try to obtain that HIV RNA assay, although sometimes um, cost is prohibitive. At 24 weeks, um, we then um, will obtain hepatitis B and hepatitis C testing. And in the unusual context in which hepatitis C was recently acquired, we also then repeat the HIV test because of some evidence that concurrent acquisition of hepatitis C and HIV um, can delay HIV seroconversion. <clears throat> I'm gonna move now from logistics and talk about barriers to NPEP and strategies to improve NPEP uptake and access. Several barriers to NPEP have been documented. One is potential users' awareness of NPEP. In a recent meta-analysis of studies from around the world, um, uh, which were focused on MSM, uh, just around 50% were aware of NPEP. And so if people are not aware of this intervention, they may not seek it. We also know from our PrEP programs that many people who come seeking PrEP um, are identified at that initial visit as being eligible for NPEP, um, ha as has already been discussed in the seminar today. Another potential is the underestimation of HIV risk from potential exposures. A third potential barrier is awareness, knowledge, and willingness to prescribe on the part of clinicians. Um, in the United States, um, NPEP is often available um, at emergency departments, um, at some clinics, um, not routinely available in, uh, from primary care clinicians, um, although some do provide it, um, but there is still limited knowledge about this intervention and some um, uncertainty about how to prescribe it among clinicians here. As I just highlighted, there are some also limitations in locations that provide NPEP, um, uh, both in the United States and elsewhere around the world. Um, so for example, in our context, it's often historically been in emergency departments. There are cost concerns, as has also already been highlighted. Um, here, um, a full course of um, NPEP without um, any assistance may cost thousands of dollars, which is out of the reach um, for many individuals. Fortunately, there are often programs that can eliminate or drastically reduce that cost, um, but that does often require some paperwork and some administrative legwork. And then finally, um, stigma, stigma about HIV and sexual behavior um, and stigma focused on LGBTQIA plus people may also limit um, NPEP uptake and access. 
Um, so what are some strategies to improve um, uptake and access? And I'll say a bit about some strategies in our context. And then I know that Dr. Coleman will also talk about strategies on a more global scale to improve um, NPEP access and uptake. So I think one of the most exciting developments here in the past few years has been the creation of 24-7 NPEP hotlines. And I'm showing three examples of those um, in the upper left from Washington, D.C., um, the bottom left from Philadelphia, and on the right-hand side from New York City. Um, these hotlines, again, they're available 24-7. People can call them if they think that they've been exposed to HIV. Um, if it's um, during regular business hours, the person is often then linked directly to a clinic that can provide NPEP. If it's after business hours, um, then the, um, uh, the um, person can speak with a clinician over the phone um, who can obtain more information about the potential exposure and about the person's health and then send an electronic prescription for a PEP starter pack to a um, local pharmacy. Um, so for example, in the New York City program, um, a PEP starter pack can be picked up at a retail pharmacy at no cost to the individual. Um, and then they follow up um, at a brick and mortar clinic um, uh, um, within the, the, um, the few days after that call for their laboratory work and then to continue with the remainder of um, that PEP course. Um, NPEP starter packs are, I think, a key intervention. They're a component of many of those 24-7 hotlines that I mentioned. We also use them in our own clinical program to provide immediate access to the medication because, again, NPEP is a time-sensitive um, strategy. These are dispensed directly to patients. And again, um, they allow us to essentially directly observe the initiation of therapy if they're provided in the clinic. We generally provide one to four days of medication, and the um, duration depends on the context. For example, if it's on a, um, a Friday um, and there is a long weekend because of a national holiday, we would provide a longer PEP starter pack. Um, but the, the purpose of the starter pack is to, again, permit um, an, a rapid initiation of therapy and then also uh, provide some time while the person can take therapy for us to sort through the administrative issues in case we need to do additional paperwork to obtain the rest of the medication for that person. Some key considerations of the starter packs um, are making sure that the person does get access to the rest of the NPEP course without a break in the medication. Um, in our context, paying for the medications to have those starter packs on hand can be a bar barrier. And then as with any medication that's Kind of maintained in the clinic and dispensed directly to patients, it's important um, to ensure that that medication has not expired. Um, there are also some um, social media campaigns to improve NPEP awareness and access and uptake. Um, I think that New York City has led the charge here um, in the U.S. setting. Um, the one on the left is an advertisement from New York City just highlighting that condoms can break, but that PEP is available to help prevent HIV exposure, um, or sorry, or sorry, HIV acquisition. There's also a user's guide to PEP there, um, and then a video from um, our CDC on the right-hand side of the slide, um, which provides information for, um, uh, for potential PEP users about um, uh, the medication. I also think it's crucial that we counsel all people who are prescribed PrEP about NPEP, what it is and when it should be used. Um, taking a step back for a moment, I think that PrEP was in many ways a paradigm shift for us um, who were involved in HIV treatment. When someone has HIV, we, um, the framework is that they take antiretroviral therapy for life in a daily fashion to prevent um, uh, uh, virologic rebound and to preserve their health. But of course, PrEP is different. People don't necessarily need to take PrEP forever. They need to take it for a period of risk. And so the, um, the paradigm for PrEP is the one shown at the bottom of this figure from a colleague of mine, Dr. Haberer, um, that people take PrEP in the context of HIV risk, but don't necessarily need to take it when risk has diminished. Um, however, we know that periods of risk and periods of PrEP use do not always align um, in uh, the experiences of our patients who are taking PrEP. And people may stop PrEP because they believe that their risk has diminished and then have a potential exposure. 
So it's really crucial, I think, that we um, counsel individuals about how to access NPEP um, and when they might need NPEP if they say have come off PrEP or have not been taking it as prescribed and they do have a potential exposure. I think the risk of HIV here in the context of stopping PrEP is shown well in this figure. Um, this is HIV incidence in MSM before, while taking, and after discontinuing TDF-FTC for PrEP use. At the very um, right-hand side, you can see that those who persisted on PrEP um, had a very low risk of HIV. Um, people who stopped and then restarted, that's the second bar from the right, um, had also had a fairly low risk, although higher than those who were persistent on PrEP. But the group that had the highest HIV incidence were those who stopped and did not restart. I think this is a call for us to make sure that it's um, relatively easy for people to get back into PrEP care if they need it, but I think also a call to educate people about NPEP and how to access it if they have an exposure um, after uh, stopping HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis. So in summary from this section, um, I would say that NPEP effectively prevents HIV following disc a discrete exposure, that many people who present for PrEP actually have an indication for NPEP at that initial visit and then can transition to PrEP afterwards. Barriers to NPEP include patients and clinicians awareness, the underestimation of HIV risk, cost, and stigma, um, but all of those barriers are overcomable. And some strategies to improve NPEP access and uptake include 24-7 NPEP hotlines which provide access to NPEP around the clock through starter packs. Um, those starter packs also in other settings, including clinics, with then linkage to the remainder of the treatment course. Social media and other awareness campaigns. Um, I mentioned that just 50% of MSM were aware of NPEP in one recent study, highlighting the need for more knowledge about this intervention. And also counseling people prescribed PrEP about NPEP. I want to thank you very much for your attention, and I'll now turn things back over um, to the organizers. Thank you, Kevin. That was spectacular and so clearly outlined on what we need to do and how we actually scale up NPEP globally. I want to now next turn it over to Megan Coleman. So Megan Coleman works as a senior technical advisor for key population at the USAID Bureau for Global Health Office of HIV and AIDS in the US. She also has a, a lot of experience as a clinician, researcher, and has several peer-reviewed publications on different regimens of pre-risk exposure prophylaxis among key populations. Uh, Megan is going to talk to us today about experiences from of PEP from USAID and PEPFAR programs globally. Over to you, Megan. Thank you for joining us. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. I'm going to share my slides. Hopefully. One second. <laughs> Is everyone able to see me now? Excellent. Yes. Okay, perfect. So I'm here today to talk to you about the opportunity for sharing experiences and implementing PEP from USA PEP bar programs. I'm so privileged to join you and for the opportunity to speak with such an amazing panel. PEP is one of my favorite things to talk about, and I think it's definitely something we don't talk about enough. As you know, HIV prevention changes over a lifetime. Combination prevention, which we covered a lot this weekend. Megan, sorry, yes. is there any way you can switch it to a slideshow mode? Because oh, I'm sorry. Is that better? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay. HIV prevention needs change over a lifetime. Combination prevention is a mix of biomedical, behavioral, and structural interventions that decrease the risk of HIV. As humans, we come in many different shapes and forms, and we need a prevention method that matches this variation. Greater impact comes from combining approaches rather than a single one, and preference from individuals and systems may depend on timing, circumstances, life courses, relationships, and personal preference, all of which requires choice. As you can see, PEP is just one tool in a biomedical prevention toolkit, and it fits into multiple options that are effective at different periods of time. Prior to exposure, we have pre-exposure prophylaxis, and then treatment as prevention or U equals U, which is also extremely pertinent at the time of exposure. And then after exposure, we have post-exposure prophylaxis, which we've just reviewed in, in amazing detail. Ideally, the spaces in which these choices are offered 
will also need to be differentiated and tailored to optimize their function, utility, scale up, as well as their choice of prevention method. And I'm gonna go through a few of those examples today. My colleague Deepika reviewed some of this, but it's important to highlight that PEP access begins with policy. The WHO in 2014 released their PEP guidelines and then 2021 included it in the consolidated guidelines for HIV prevention. Many of these we already went through before. But non-occupational PEP can be limited by country policy and regulations that either limit PEP only to occupational exposures or limit where it's offered or limit how it is delivered. The maximizing options to advanced informed choice for HIV prevention or the Mosaic trial put together in June 2022 a policy brief. And the Mosaic trial is a five-year PEPFARD funded USA project that is accelerating scale up of PrEP products in Southern and Eastern Africa. And it summarizes the PEP policy landscape, but also includes some additional recommendations on how to address policy, implementation barriers, and recommends ways to address to and, and address access to and increase uptake to PEP as part of HIV prevention. PrEP is extremely effective when taken as directed, but as we talked about, only one form. And, and some people have difficulties taking PrEP as directed. There can be a inconsistent PrEP use. There can be people who are not on PrEP or don't want to take, and that can be due to the pill burden or fatigue. They're less frequent or less predictable potential exposures, that difficulty anticipating risk that we mentioned earlier, a need for post-sexual assault or violence, and stigma and fear of disclosure. There also is limited or inability to access PrEP, and that may be something to think about. The opportunity for PEP as an option to meet individual and system level prevention needs exists, and I'm really excited to talk about it today. The examples we're gonna cover, and I'm gonna focus on a key population focus, is facility-based models, outreaches or mobile clinics, demand generation or PEP awareness that's been integrated into online and offline outreach, key population-led, which is usually at community-based sites or drop-in centers, pharmacy-led as part of a decentralized drug distribution model, and last but not least, telemedicine. The one we're most familiar with is the facility model. It's the common most model used in most countries. It's led by health providers, but provider attitudes can sometimes hinder access, especially for key populations and marginalized populations. Many people may require, sorry, prior knowledge of PEP for people to present those facilities on their own, like post-sexual assault. Clients are sometimes identified at the community outreaches and then brought with a peer to the facility. They can be subject to perceived or actual requirements for police reports or partner presenting for HIV testing that can limit their disclosure and also limit their access. Outreach workers or peer educators provide adherence support, ensure completion of PEP course and follow up as needed. Another model that we talked about a little bit on Saturday, I believe, is drop-in centers, differentiated service delivery models. They're often at community-based sites led by civil, so civil society organizations. They're safe spaces where comprehensive HIV services are often provided under one roof. PEP is most often offered for occupational exposure, but can also be available for other forms. See, I referenced the Mosaic policy for further information. You may offer a full PEP initiation at that visit, or they can have a starter pack before a referral back to a medical facility or traditional place for further assessment and a full 28 day supply. Services are provided by a variety of individuals and service models. We see nurses and medical officers, but we also see task shifting with trained peer educators and outreach workers. And they often have support for more experienced clinicians back at public facilities, or some are located on site as well. A country example is Kenya, who offers PEP as part of an essential package of services for key populations and for post-sexual social assault. It's provided at no cost to the patient at the drop-in center and facilities and a full 28-day supply. Often included in this safe space or one-stop model is a community-based crisis response team. So the key population in need of PEP can reach out to peers in their community and be directed to PEP as needed. In Eswatini, the national guidelines support PEP for high-risk sexual exposures, and that includes for key populations. EPIC, a USAID implementing partner, provided this breakdown of PEP initiations with their drop-in center model. A total of 145 patients initiated PEP, and it was split with 119 were started at the drop-in center and 26 at the community and at the mobile site. 64 of those who received PEP transitioned to PrEP, and that was a mix between daily or ED PrEP. 
Also included on the slide is a breakdown of age and key population group. You can see that it reached many patients or many clients that were at risk or vulnerable for HIV infection. Another model we see in the United States that Dr. Art has already reviewed is the citywide PEP hotline. Frequently, we wonder what happens after we launch these programs, how it is used by the population. In the DC context, which I was very lucky to be involved in and creating, I wanted to share some of the follow-up. In the first 18 months of the PEP hotline, there have been over 450 PEP starts and follow-ups. On the bottom is a slower, it's an older slide from the initial 12-week evaluation, but the trend of PEP to PrEP transitions continues, with an average of about 40 to 45% of those who start PEP transition over to PrEP. For reference, in the 12 months prior to the launch, the DC Sexual Health Clinic had started just 62 patients on PEP. Since the early days of the, the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen an increase in the use of HIV telemedicine across HIV service delivery, and that includes PEP. We are seeing mobile health applications and other models being piloted as acceptable platforms for PEP uptake and use. There are some advantages to the strategy, such as virtual or tech-based strategies can circumvent some of the structural barriers faced by key populations in marginalized communities. In this model, a medical history and clinical assessment for PEP are conducted online and PEP is offered and then initiated at the partner site or a partner pharmacy. Virtual support frequently continues for adherence navigation, especially when combined with online platforms to ensure that there's access to integrated services that include HIV screening, STI screening, PEP, family planning, among others. PEP provides an opportunity for informed choice, shared decision-making and an action-oriented response to high-risk exposure. It's important in the age of PrEP to not forget about the tools that brought us, that brought us to the table. And NPEP is an amazing tool to be used in collaboration with other biomedical prevention tools. It is the only prevention method that we have that you can start after a high-risk exposure. And those are frequently neither planned nor anticipated. Also, as mentioned before, it can be a bridge to other prevention methods for persons with ongoing risk. PEP initiation is an opportunity to discuss all prevention options, and it's important that PrEP should be discussed with all PEP users, regardless of whether they are first time or repeat PEP access. I also want to cover an exciting study in East Africa that was just presented at CROI 2023. The Search Sapphire study in Kenya and Uganda is a randomized trial. It's looking at discrete, discrete choice prevention versus standard of care in the outpatient health care facilities. The dynamic choice arm is listed below in figure one, but it's a choice of PEP or PrEP, condoms, and choice of HIV testing modality, and visit location, and all are with a patient-centered model of care. As you can see, that product choice differed over the course of the study, but at 48 weeks, it resulted in a twofold greater time covered by prevention option when compared to standard of care alone among when men and women in the general outpatient setting. We've learned a lot of lessons in the field from USAID and EPIC, and I've asked a few of my colleagues and mission partners and implementing partners um, and community health centers to give me their feedback to share for you today. Many of the national policies may allow PEP following all forms of exposure, but many frequently do not include people with injection-related potential exposures, and that's a gap. Rollout of NPEP is limited and may, not have, and may have associated fees and barriers not seen with occupational PEP, and it may be free, but then the associated labs may not be. There's frequently a lack of awareness on the part of clients of the end providers. Providers may have a lack of knowledge around NPEP and then not bring it up in situations where it could be appropriate. And the community, it's, it highlights the importance of community engagement to support PEP uptake so that patients can know and advocate for it for themselves. We have seen a poor linkage between PEP and PrEP. And we can attribute some of that to the scale, to PrEP scale up, which is opportunity, of, which has provided an opportunity to focus on PEP, but a lot of attention has shifted mostly to PrEP. Stigma and discrimination can discourage PEP initiation and adherence, especially with key populations and gender-based violence or post-sexual assault. There are supply chain stockouts of ARVs and PEP, especially in resource-constrained settings. And there's a challenge of completing PEP with limited resources for those on PEP. 
There are gaps in reporting and limited monitoring evaluation tools. And in, indeed, most programs have no target. So it was difficult to get implementation data back um, to share today. Other recommendations of the field is that you ensure your national guidelines are updated to simplify and diversify PEP provision. Integrate PEP and PrEP at all sites where PrEP services are currently provided. There is an importance of community engagement to promote awareness, encourage uptake of services, and reduce, reduce stigma and discrimination. The sustainability of NPEP program depends on sustained funding, which is critical to the vision of comprehensive care and support services. Healthcare providers require ongoing training capacity building to ensure that they are equipped with high knowledge and skills to provide high quality services. Promoting research and evaluation of PE programs can help identify best practices, challenges, and solutions for improving program implementation and outcomes. In addressing stigma and discrimination through awareness raising campaigns, training programs to reduce barriers to accessing services can also help. And last but not least, ensuring adequate supply of medications through effective procurement and supply chain management can help ensure that individuals have the access to medications they need. Ending the HIV epidemic by 2030 is possible, but will require a holistic person-centered approach and choice matters in the prevention modality, whether it's PEP, PrEP, condoms, et cetera. Integrating PEP into a dynamic choice model can represent opportunities for increased prevention coverage, which is pretty exciting. And the key takeaway from all of this is making PEP easy and accessible is key to uptake. And you must, compete, must consider competing health priorities and service integration and commodity planning as you're doing all of this. I've included some resources at the end of this um, if anybody would like to learn any more. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for, my, for your time. Thank you, Megan, for providing us a broad overview of different models of implementation globally. We'll take all question and answers in the end. Uh, so next, as you all know, we always save the best for last. And so it is my distinct pleasure to invite Dr. Ishwar Gilada. I think I have known Dr. Ishwar Gilada since I was in high school. Not that I'm trying to age myself or to age him, but I've known him for almost as long as we've had HIV in India. So Dr. Gilada is among the first people to establish one of the HIV clinics in India. He also was like, a warrior against the HIV epidemic in India right from the start. He, um, he started one of the first clinics in the Unison Medicare and continues to practice there. He's also the president of the AIDS Society of India and a governing council member of the International AIDS Society. He has won several awards, and I think in interest of time, I'm going to skip all these awards. Otherwise, you will only be hearing about his awards, and I will eat into his presentation time. I think for most of you in India, Dr. Gilada doesn't need an introduction. So over to you, Dr. Gilada, who's going to talk to us about PEP and NPEP in the Indian context. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you very much, Sunil, uh, for this lovely introduction. Yes, I have known you since your child, and uh, we, uh, your mother and me, used to converse many times uh, when first cases were diagnosed. Uh, can I re uh, request Jalpa to share my presentation? Uh, so that it becomes easy. For Dr. Gilada, we are not able to hear you well. If you can just change the setting of your audio a little bit. It's very minute. Is it okay now? It's, it's much better now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Sunil, for uh, this lovely introduction. Uh, can I request Jalpa to share my presentation? Sure. I would like to thank the organizers for uh, bringing me in the galaxy of speakers. Uh, it's a very important issue where we are conversing on uh, PrEP and PEP, PrEP was done uh, last week, PEP is done today. Uh, in India, we have sometimes double standards. The same thing we have seen about uh, when we started uh, uh, kind of promotion of condoms. And uh, they, they were used to tell people that you are promoting condom, uh, that means you are uh, promoting some kind of behavior. Those who are not doing anything, they will start doing it. And same thing is happening with uh, PEP and PrEP. So when a person either infected or uh, suspected or exposed to HIV or any STD, they, the person comes like this. Uh, and there are a lot of issues and we need to address as a doctor, as a counselor, all such issues. We cannot expect that every amount of time we can uh, refer the person to a psychiatrist and women specialist or other specialist. We need to deal uh, everything and we need to have a handy things or sometimes we can use peer counselors. Next slide, please. 
So when we talk about sexual health, is men, women, all the communities which we are uh, hearing about, we know about it. We 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 have to discuss lots of issues, not only uh, sexual issues, but there are a lot of societal issues. Next slide, please. So if we currently look at in last, I think four or five years, we are getting younger and younger people coming who are diagnosed for the first time with HIV. And a lot of our people are below 20. Uh, either they are HIV positive already, or they're exposed to HIV, or they come for PEP. So I think the entire shift is there in the age, and I will explain to you why. Next slide, please. So actually, uh, being counselor, being doctors, being society, being government, we should help everybody, whether the person is from A community, B community, whether the person had uh, intentionally had some sexual uh, pleasure, we should help everybody. So whether it's a PrEP or PEP, we should be uh, open to everybody. Secondly, what we see currently, for half of the world is under 25 and LGBTQIA, as you keep on adding one of the alphabets, then the percentage uh, increases. But currently it's almost 10% of the population is in this group. Um, uh, age of establishing preventable health, this behavior is also changing. And developing healthy behavior now is more effective than trying to change already established behavior or healthy behavior. Teach one to teach others. So basically, even patient comes to you, we need to prevent a lot of other uh, eventualities through that patient. Next slide. Please. This kind of awareness campaign, which were in full swing all over the country, all over the world, between 95 to 2005, more so in the government supported program till 2010, that entire awareness died down. Because as soon as we started adding another program, uh, we went into the phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four of the National AIDS Control Program. We kept on forgetting what was in the phase one and phase two. So when we added ART into program, we, <coughs> we stopped giving importance to awareness campaign. We stopped giving importance to intervention campaign. And most of the programs are almost died. Now what happened? Next slide, please. So there's a cohort effect. And those people who had seen that kind of profile and campaign, they, they, they could prevent themselves to some extent. Next slide, please. But those which were young people who were, next slide, please. And those who were born during that time, next slide, please. So the sorry, said high profile campaign was around 2005. And the person who was born around 2000 or so, he was four, five years, seven years, 10 years old. That kind of person was not exposed to high profile campaign. And now when they land up, we think that the society being educated, the education level is going up, they'll be aware about all these things, they are not. And therefore, we are having that cohort effect where younger and younger people are getting into problem, older people are not getting into that problem because they have had exposure to the campaign. Next slide. Moreover, we should, we should have used innovation as a national nation, but we should use that. Now, when we talk about innovations, the awareness campaign has to go from traditional to non-traditional way. It has to go for, for the current uh, uh, area of people. For example, social media, net, social networking, Hore, whether it's uh, Instagram, whether it's uh, YouTube and mobile apps. So a lot of people who come to us, they have hooked up through either Tinder or Grindr apps. So we should have a campaign on Tinder and Grindr also. We have to catch them young. It can be college orientation program because in the college orientation programs, they are uh, happy go lucky. The syllabus has not yet opened up. They are very open to uh, hear some, something new. Medical students and postgraduate students. Often we think that there is no need to teach medical students and no need to teach uh, a postgraduate student. As a medical student, the first class ever we had about sexuality was nothing. We, we never heard anything about sexuality and uh, sexual education. So we have to learn on our way. And we also have to target non-formal youth because those which are not going to school or colleges, we need to also target them because they are actually a little bit higher risk than those which are in the uh, uh, kind of organized groups. Next slide. So what currently we are seeing that STDs are increasing. What STDs are increasing? HSV, HPV, HPV is very high, particularly in MSM community is very high. Syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, the donovanosis. 
Now, uh, as a uh, STD specialist at Jeja Hospital, we used to see every day hundreds of cases. Thereafter, 10, 15, 20 years, the cases went down, and we could hardly see one gonorrhea, one chlamydia in a year or two. Now, again, it's, we started seeing at least once a week one case of gonorrhea or chlamydia. So it has started coming up. Donovanosis is seen only in coastal belt of India, in either east or in the uh, west. It is not seen in mainland. I don't know what is the reason. Nobody could find out. So we are seeing these uh, infections coming more at, uh, in the last five to 10 years. Next slide. So basically, they can go to, for testing. They can go for any guidance, either to us or to any clinic. But there are more than 1,060 ICTC centers, integrated counseling and testing centers. They can all go there. They can have a home testing. Now, there is a dilemma in India. Home testing, you can go on Amazon and buy a home testing kit. But if you ask NACO, if you ask a program, it is not a part of the program. Next slide. Please. So what we need to have is a person-centered, person-friendly, person-driven, community-based approach. Or if community-based approach is not there, community-friendly uh, 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 approach has to be there. Next slide. Please. So everywhere, U is equal to U has become a very important thing. And I think that has changed the face of the epidemic. Uh, we see a lot of people are convinced and though we uh, plan to have positive positive alliances that means positive person hi positive person should marry hi positive person there are more marriages or more alliances are now being done in positive and negative and that is solely because of u is equal to u and they know that next slide please now this is the most uh, famous slide internationally which shows what is combination prevention but i would like to focus on only pp and uh, next slide please And basically, we ask, how do you do? How do you do it? And it has to be everything. When PrEP is added, PrEP is not replacement of condom. It is in addition to condom. But a lot of people did not realize that. They use PrEP, and they are getting other STDs. Next slide. We had certain Indian treatises. For example, Kama Sutra, 1850-year-old treatise. And we use that to the advantage of people because their understanding was that they wanted change. So we said, OK. Many postures with one, better than one with many. You want change, change posture. And in our art and treatise of Kama Sutra or Kajura or everywhere, everything has been depicted. It is, um, uh, MSM has been depicted, uh, uh, lesbianism has been depicted, multi-partner sex has been depicted. So if it was not there that time, it would not have been depicted. So that was a uh, realistic depiction from the society at that time also. Next slide. And is a safe or sorry, the very simple thing. Be safe. Next slide, please. And uh, we uh, tried to extend the philosophy of Mahatma Gandhi. It was only three monkeys. But in the era of HIV, in the era of STD, the fourth monkey is important. And that ABC approach, abstain, be faithful, condom, has to go beyond. And we need to add that alphabet, which is P and P. So both the fourth monkey is important. And the PNP is important. PNP is a PrEP and PP. Next slide. So basically, all this has been told to you by my two speakers. What is the definition of exposure? And exposure need not be only sexual exposure. There can be parasexual exposure. There can be non-sexual exposure. So people will understand based on what it has been done. So whether it is a what is infectious and it has been uh, always a uh, very much uh, a tricky issue where the entire HIV awareness campaign in the country was initially based from USA, that HIV is transmitted through bodily fluids. And people understood that bodily fluids can be tears, it can be sweet, it can be urine, but it is not. So we needed, we needed to specify that what is infectious, what is potentially infectious, what is not non-infectious. Next slide. Now, PP isn't a new. PP was there existing earlier also. And it is not only for HIV. Uh, during the rainy season, we ask them to take doxycycline for preventing leptospirosis. Rabies, we provide them uh, anti-rabies uh, uh, serum. For hepatitis B, we provide rapid immunization as well as immunoglobulin. Syphilis, there's a prevention. Syphilis, gonorrhea, chancroid now can be prevented with, with just only 200 milligram of doxy. It's called doxypep. But somehow, these are not becoming popular because somehow our STD specialist probably 
did not want to popularize that because if they popularize that, less STD cases will come. How will they survive? Next slide. So PEP and PrEP, they are not becoming popular because of certain issues. Particularly, it is not part of our uh, national program. PEP, professional PEP, uh, no, professional exposure. When you say professional exposure, a sex worker will say that my profession is sex work. So how can you say that professional sex uh, exposure means only those which are in the medical profession? So I think there are always uh, identity crisis. There are some kind of uh, you know, fluid uh, definitions. And as we were talking about condom, same uh, argument is put forth by the national program that how long we can provide prep. And uh, because in uh, just recently we had a discussion with the national AIDS control program, what they say that for uh, treatment, because I put an argument that you are willing to provide free treatment for a lifetime if person gets HIV. But if the person wants to take PrEP to prevent HIV, you are not providing. They said, no, because we don't have a system or budget because we know how many patients are there estimated, how many, what is the budget required for so many years. So, uh, but we cannot calculate PrEP. What is the requirement? There was no good argument. Why PrEP is not provided? Why self-test uh, uh, is not provided? Why PEP for sexual exposure is not provided? We had to campaign for at least 10 years to see that even uh, victims of sexual assault are provided PEP. My recommendation was that PEP should be provided in the police station because as soon as sexual assault happens, person goes to police station. So in all casualties and all police station, because they work in tandem with each other, that should be provided at least now that has come in the program that victims of sexual assault are provided PEP. Next slide. So occupational PEP is a needle stick injury or mucosal exposure, sometimes uh, it splashes. But non-occupational or we, uh, we popularly call PEPSE, which is a, a PEP for sexual exposure. It can be condom breakage. We need to decide condom broken where? At the tip, in the mid, or in the shaft or at the rim. And tip is more dangerous than the uh, rim. Condom leg sex with HIV infected person. Often people use condom only for particular sexual act. Pre act and post act, they don't use. Sexual assault, sharing injections, non-occupational uh, percutaneous injuries. Next slide. Please. Then there is a, we have seen exploitation at the hands of uh, uh, at risk people and HIV phobia people. Often we get four to five times more HIV phobia people than who are really exposed. And there are some of the sex, like even my, I, my whole 42 years of the life as professional life has gone in uh, STD and sexuality patients. But I didn't know what is memory sex. And somebody said, I have done a memory sex. So uh, where was the sex? Sex was in between um, you know, breasts. So a lot of new terminologies we are hearing. Uh, we, we never we knew active, passive, now bottom, versatile, top. So all these things, terminologies we have to learn. But what is happening, there are a lot of quacks which are dispensing any kind of spurious medicine. Not only that, there are qualified people who call themselves HIV specialists. One is sitting in Delhi and he charges 55,000 per PEP. So I think there is no regulation in this country to see that the people who are with at a difficulty are not exploited. And this kind of situation should stop. There has to be a lot of outlets available, a lot of helplines available. And on just helpline uh, complaint also, people should be able to take action. Eventually, it will bring bad name to the entire medical profession, as it is our profession is as Badnam as Munni. You know, in the film, there's Munni Badnam. So similarly, medical professionals are defamed. <clears throat> and uh, so uh, public for not providing in all public setups, I am private sector for over treating. And therefore, uh, my recommendation will come that HIV phobia people do not need PEP. Next slide. Uh, Sao Paulo study has shown why PEP is important, but I don't want to go through the studies. Next, I can skip those slides. So basically, in management of PEP, you have, a, you have to do a risk of acquisition, whether the risk is real or not, timing, and follow-up of testing and monitoring, and adherence and risk reduction. So these things, all four things are important. Next slide. So when we talk about relative risk of transition, uh, transmission, per cutaneous is only 0.3% or 3 in 1000. Mucous membrane is 0.1% nearly, 1 in 1000. Non-intact skin exposure is almost similar or less than that. And intact skin is zero. 
and we need to tell people because sometimes they say i touch there she touch me uh, i i thought i thought some blood there these are all uh, uh, what do you call it? hypothetical situations next slide please and risk of transmission per exposure from hiv infected person not on art is so you need to have whether person is on art which art whether is suppressed or she is suppressed so receptive anal intercourse is one around 1% or 1.1% Insertive anal intercourse is 0.06%. Uh, receptive vaginal intercourse is 0.1%. Insertive vaginal intercourse is 0.1% or 0.08%. Receptive oral sex, very low, but we got two cases of uh, oral sex transmission. So we cannot say zero. Insertive uh, oral sex, 0%. Uh, uh, what is the blood transfusion? Almost 100%. Needle stick injury, 0.3% or 3 in 1,000 again. And sharing injecting equipment is around double than that, that is 0.7%. Next slide. So risk of HIV acquisition, is exposure is considered high risk when is a condomless anal or vaginal intercourse, is a percutaneous exposure to blood. And start PEP if source is HIV infected or source, uh, source is at high risk for being HIV infected and sexual assault. So in the second level, uh, sometimes you put a question and you say, no, no, she, she said she had sex for the first time. So sometimes there are a lot of things unbelievable. So for every such exposure, you should better offer PP. The things have changed with PP because PPs have become safer uh, as against uh, AZT based PP. Next slide. And what drug, drugs to be introduced? There's a single pill available uh, in the national program. They say TLD or uh, TDF, 3 tc DTG. But uh, there's a medicine available as a three-in-one combination, which is TD, uh, TAF, Emtisitabine, Bolotegavir. TAF is also approved recently for the PP. So it can be TDF or TAF. But if we are using TAF or TD, uh, TAF with Bolotegavir or Latigavir, it is 25 milligram. If you are using that with boosted uh, uh, PI, it has to be 10 milligram. And Tinofovir and Emtisitabine, either they, they can be also given. So sometimes affordability issues are there. Sometimes we also know that risk is not so high. And in that situation, tenofovir and Pisitabe can be given. There are some issues where person is on PrEP and uh, again uh, was exposed. So PrEP here act as a PEP also. Next slide. Okay. So if you look at the, yeah. Uh, Quickly, because I think we have question and answers. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, uh, I can just run through. This is a national guideline, which is 2021, which says what are the recommendations on PP, what are the drugs. Next slide, please. I'll just rush through. And uh, it, it is also said assessment. I, I said it briefly, but they have given an entire uh, breakup. What is the assessment? What counseling support is required? What prescription and how to follow? Next slide. So basically, uh, it is very important to provide PEP within 48 hours, extended up to 72 hours. Because as soon as the person is exposed, exposure is only at the mucosal surface. So that is called day zero. But between zero to two, that is 48 hours, virus is collected by the dendritic cells and brought to the lymph node. And from day four to 11, the virus is replicated and released in blood. So thereafter, PEP is not required, it is not going to help. But day three is silent here, and therefore we give benefit of doubt when the person come up to 72 hours. Next slide, please. And 72 hour timing. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Take home message basically choose between safe sex, no sex, prep. Once slip this chance, then new ways of preventing HIV, and that is daily prep or emergency PEP, vaccines are for adults too, uh, because I'm going to explain about vaccines. Better to be safe than sorry. HIV phobia doesn't need to be treated with PEP. Public access should provide PEPSA as well as PREP. Next slide. And it is cannot be a one, uh, one fit for all. So here, uh, whether it's a cap or cloth or condom or chapels, all C, 4C, you have to uh, choose between what is required. And similarly, PP is not one. It depends on how it will be suitable to the person. Next slide. So thank you very much. Thank you, Accelerate. Thank you, Jalpa. And thank you, Sunil, for having me on this program. And if anything is required, you can come back to me. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Gilara. As always, I think we could count on you for an entertaining talk and for taking us all the way from the Vedas to the New England Journal of Medicine. So if I can request Kevin and Megan to turn on their cameras, we'll move to the question and answer. I have a few questions on here. Kanchan, I'm not sure if you're able to unmute and ask your question. But while we are waiting for Kanchan to unmute, uh, Megan, I think one of the comments that was made by Dr. Bivar, Dr. Rivari before he left was, it's not just about the guidelines, but also about access and how access and supply chain is an issue. I think in many of the countries that you presented programs from, I think USAID and PEPFAR does a lot of the procurement, but in India, we're not allowed to do the procurement. So establishing these models and developing these, uh, I, I guess the evidence to scale it up, how would you suggest addressing that in a setting where we're not allowed to procure uh, medications? That's a wonderful question and something I've given a, a lot of thought of. And I think that you also have given a lot of thought of this as you think about scaling up PrEP and understanding uptake and utilization is going to be key at anticipating um, drug demand and procurement needs. So as you're scaling up NPEP, um, incorporating into PrEP programs where you're also tracking this is one opportunity to be able to provide ongoing monitoring evaluation on this. And then that can lead to increased information on procurement and drug supply. The other is also tacking it into ART treatment centers where many of these are offered as well. And then increasing understanding how much PEP uptake is taken and, and tracking and monitoring that and then scaling that up as time goes on as you understand the utilization. So creating a buffer and then moving forward as you gather information, the monitoring evaluation is going to be key to understand use. Thank you, Megan. I believe uh, Pension is driving. So I guess the question for you, uh, Kevin from Kanchan was like, if a client has started prep and had unsafe sex four days after starting the regimen and inquired if they need to take NPEP to deal with that particular exposure, what would you do? So it's basically the question of like, if someone's on prep, would you also require post-exposure prophylaxis and that balance between prep and PEP, I guess? Yep. Um, that's a great question. And I think in general, for people who are taking an adherent to PrEP, there is no, no need to provide PEP if they have an exposure, unless you know we know, for example, that the HIV they were exposed to was resistant to the medications in PrEP. I mean, that would be a very unusual scenario. I think the question about like very soon after starting PrEP is that, like perhaps a bit more nuanced. And I think I want to know more about the context of that exposure. Um, you know, we know that on-demand PrEP works among MSM. Um, I think in a in a man who has sex with men, I think I would not think anything additional would be needed. Um, you know, there's some data to suggest that it it takes longer to achieve um, maximal levels of tenofovir in tissue and cisgender women, and so I might think a little bit differently in that context. But I'd also highlight that, um, you know, we used uh, two drug regimens for PEP for a long time before the most recent iteration of guidance. So the person's PrEP, you know, in that scenario would likely function as PEP anyway. Thanks, Kevin. Dr. <clears throat> Another question from Kanshan, maybe you could answer this question. Like, what are the screening tests that we would absolutely have to do before non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis? And can we also continue someone who's finished non-occupational PEP onto PrEP if the risk is still justifies it? So Neil, is that directed to me, those questions? Yeah. Uh, sure, go ahead. <laughs> Um, so, um, you know, really the most important thing for PEP is to start the medicine. So, um, you know, I would say um, obtaining the baseline laboratory studies is a bit of secondary importance, but just starting the medicine because of its time sensitive nature. Um, the person should have a baseline HIV test. Um, and then there are some other tests that are recommended in our setting um, as part of that baseline evaluation. Some of those are, I think, you know, far less important. Like, um, you know, we assess kidney function and liver enzymes, but that I think uh, you know, could vary depending on the context, but um, fine to start the medicine before obtaining any labs. And then in people who have a high ongoing risk for HIV, I think transitioning to PrEP immediately after the course of PEP makes a lot of sense and is what I would do. There's no need to have a break between those two interventions. And in fact, we have data showing that people who 
um, who receive PEP that um, in certain populations that many of them have a subsequently high incidence of HIV months later, I think indicating the need for ongoing PrEP after that PEP course. So a seamless transition um, is fine. Thank you, Kevin. Dr. Gilara, maybe a question for you. Uh, I think you talked about our need for changing the way we address social media campaigns and moving to Grindr and Tinder and all these different platforms. So what do you think will be the major challenges with the youths today? Because I think that whole behavioral disinhibition is a lot more common because they're not seeing the suffering that we saw in the 90s and 80s where people who picked up HIV, where most of them were transitioning to, uh, to full stage AIDS. And so there's this, and as you mentioned already, there is an increase in STIs. So how would you actually think about that, such a program within the Indian context? Uh, we need to restart the, what was going on about 30 years back, 20 years back. We need to restart. Uh, we need to revitalize the younger generation, particularly those which are younger uh, professionals. And uh, HIV should be also club with HIV, hepatitis B, antimicrobial resistance, uh, STIs, sexual issues. I think four or five things. And then it can go as a capsule to young people, whether they are formal youth or non-formal youth, whether they are college or uh, at ninth or 10th standard. The resistance which we faced earlier in the school uh, sex education program is no more there now. They are, they are now quite open. So I think those who would be activists or educators, for them it will be easy. And uh, we really need to go through the social media platforms. And because if the ill information is available, uh, well information should be also made available in the same platform. And they are open. It's not that they are not open. A lot of people know about PEP but people do not know about PrEP. I don't know why PrEP has not become uh, even a popular word in this country. So I think unless until we percolate those uh, media platform and formal uh, programs, uh, at least from our side, we are going to start. We just discussed last week only that we need to do the same thing again. Uh, I may not be able to go to all the schools and colleges now, but at least younger generation, uh, people, uh, we will train them, we will tell them. And uh, thankfully on the same day when we are thinking uh, Mumbai District AIDS Control Society came and they said we would like to support any such idea and we'll we'll take it forward. So I think that Red Ribbon Club, Youth Club, or uh, sexual health uh, clinics, that approach should be utilized positively. And one should be having a lesser of the two evil, even if you call it evil. So uh, it is not, we cannot take the moralistic attitude. We cannot be saying that because we have not done anything, the next generation should not do. That is their choice. And we need to provide everything. Maybe whether it's a PrEP or PEP or condom, or if they are positive, uh, then uh, uh, despite being positive, treatment, marriage, uh, alliances, everything. Nothing should be compromised because I often say that today God Almighty comes to you in one hand diabetes, one hand HIV. You must take one, take HIV. And that is become that easy, that simple to manage. So I think uh, with this kind of ideology, if we go, young people will definitely listen. Thank you, Dr. Gilada. I'm hoping the answer would have been like, we, we pick option C, whatever that would have been. But uh, Kevin, I guess another question for you is, what is the role of a pro-viral DNA test in starting post-exposure prophylaxis? Um, that is a great question. I have never thought about that before. And I, I to my knowledge, it's not been studied, but I, um, I, I would you know, not routinely seek that test um, right now. I'm curious if anyone else on the panel um, has a different answer, but. Dr. Millen. No, I think uh, till three days, anything can be seen. And uh, after three days, if you see positive, then uh, you, you miss the chance of PP. So I think if at all you want to do anything, you start PP and keep on doing, explore uh, all other things, including testing of a partner uh, who, or to whom the person is exposed. If that partner is negative, you can start, uh, stop PP. So at least if you want to think of proviral DNA or any RNA test, do of the partner rather than the person. Thank you, Dr. Gelada. So Megan, I think you outlined several challenges in the scale up of post-exposure prophylaxis. I think trying to think about it from the Indian context, how do you think we would, like I, I know things have changed, like section 377 has been repealed, but still I think there still are a lot of barriers related to stigma and discrimination within the Indian context and, and a lack of awareness. So we had to pick one barrier to address first within the Indian context. What would you suggest we would start working with? Easy question. Um, I think for me, 
you take it back to the community, you take it back to the individuals, you want to increase awareness of, of HIV around youth, you work with youth investors, you work with youth leaders, you work, you go to the youth, you want to build PEP and PrEP awareness um, among transgender women. It's really these trusted partners, leaders, people like yourselves also in the room, you train clinicians. And so you really have to work for stigma, especially around HIV prevention from the top and the bottom. So it works at the policy level, you do interventions at the clinician level, such as this, you have to be open to a sexual history in a non-judgmental non manner, which I did not learn how to do when I was in school and took a lot of years of training to change my own perceived biases that I did not know I had when I was going through these trainings and going through delivering sexual histories or talking to patients. And so I think that's where it starts with clinicians. And then for patients or communities, it's building up advocacy at the ground level. It's increasing awareness and driving demand. Sometimes things won't change unless people ask them or demand them or work with them to change. And so knowing your rights, knowing what you have access to and how to get it and making it easy is going to be some of the first steps to decreasing that stigma. Thank you, Megan, for that outline. I think as much as we would like to do everything everywhere all at once outside of Hollywood, that's really not possible. Uh, Kevin, I guess a, a last question for you was uh, in the instance of a condom breakage that requires PrEP, is there a difference in case the person ejaculates versus does not ejaculate? Like, would, would you consider it differently in those situations? You know, presumably the risk is higher with ejaculation, but I think, um, you know, I, if someone has had condomless sex or sex with condom breakage with a person who has HIV, I mean, I think I would consider PEP um, regardless. Um, uh, I, um, you know, this, I think what this question also gets at is this kind of case by case determination category where we don't know uh, that the source individual has HIV. And really that's just based on a clinical judgment and it can be very challenging. Um, uh, in many scenarios. And so, you know, we counsel the patients about what is known about the risk um, and, um, and pursue PEP um, if we think the risk is significant. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so we will be winding up soon. I just want to let everyone know, all the attendees know. So there is a poll up there, which has different topics for the next webinar. So if you have the time, please log on to the poll. It's uh, it's part of the Zoom, so you can actually pick the different topics so you can see the feedback. So we'll keep that running in terms of the next topics. And I think one last question for all three of you, I think trying to bring it back to the Indian context, Kevin, I think you provided most of the evidence based on what reg regimens are available in the US, like for example, BFTAF, et cetera. But in the Indian context where we have every single tablet regimen you can think of. We have BFTAF, we have Tenofovir, Lamivudine, Dolutegravir as like a one drug regimen. So in this situation, I guess we'll start with Kevin, then move to Megan and then to Dr. Gilada. Would you have a preference or do you think any other integrated single tablet regimens are good enough? Just to make it clear that people, what, what they should be thinking of, because I think Dr. Gilada brought the point about affordability as well. So there are different prices. So would are there any benefits of one over the other or you think they're all equal? in the eyes of HIV, I guess. From, from my perspective, I would use a single tablet regimen containing an integrase inhibitor that is the most, the, the kind of most accessible, um, uh, best tolerated, and you know, not one that contains a pharmacologic booster just because of medication interaction. So something with you know, dogutegravir, for example, um, a regimen containing bictegravir, but ideally something single tablet regimen with a well-tolerated integrase inhibitor. Thanks, Kevin. Megan, any thoughts on regimens? I completely agree with Kevin. Just something, try to avoid boosters, one tablet once a day, um, and something that potentially people can walk out with in hand so that's easily accessible. And Dr. Gilada, your final words, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, single tablet regimen has not been tried. I don't know why since beginning it has been double or triple. And dolutegravir is such a robust drug it doesn't need anybody's support. So if, even if they all of them backed out, the can be a very important thing to be tried as a single drug regimen. That is one thing. And I think we should also look at HIV and aging because a lot of people who have been on HIV treatment, 
they, they become aged. Uh, they, are, they are people with me for 31, 32 years. And uh, uh, when they were 22, 25, they were diagnosed. And now they're 55, 60, 65. So I think such people uh, need to be taken into account. So I think those people who are practicing HIV, they should know what are the HIV and aging related issues. And that should be taken up as a plan. Thank you, Dr. Gilad. I think that is actually one of the topics we have for the next webinar. So before I turn it over to Jalpa, I request all the participants who are able to turn your cameras on, please turn your cameras on so we can take a, a virtual group picture. Again, one of the joys of COVID where we never see each other, but we seem to know each other really well. We actually know more about each other's houses that, during COVID than we did pre-COVID, but probably never seen each other in person. So Jalpa, I'll turn it over to you and the others to take us through the end. And while people are turning on the cameras, Deepika had to have the last word. And so she posted something and highlighting that one of the areas that we need to strengthen is also talking about the NCAP, NPEP capacity building among service pro providers and conducting routine inquiry for gender-based violence, intimate partner violence, and referral for GBV services. And she has highlighted the biggest challenge we have, which requires an interministerial collaboration. I think this is not an issue unique to India. I think globally, we sort of like waste resources. You're reaching the same people from an HIV program and a TB program and a viral hepatitis program. If, if only we could get them all to talk together and be friends. Over to you, Jalpa. Thank you, Sunil. Uh, Rishi, did we get the picture? Yeah, Jalpa, it's done. Great, thank you. Um, so I'd now like to invite uh, Mr. Aditya Singh, uh, the Executive Director for the program Accelerate at Johns Hopkins University to end the session with his concluding remarks. Thanks, over to you, Aditya. Yeah, thank you so much. I promised myself I wouldn't use the word uh, insightful, but I don't think there's much choice. So thank you to all the speakers for a very insightful um, a, a discussion today. Uh, I think uh, that's just a common thread I think that we saw across all the speakers, I think who each all uh, brought a lot to the table. But I think essentially what we understand is that PEP though is effective is not a magic pill and it requires I think uh, several interventions around it. I think we, we talked about support systems, we talked about innovations, about the need to follow up, demand generation, uh, there need to be uh, policy regulations and guidance uh, from the government as well. Uh, so I think uh, leading to that was also the fact that there's an intersection with other programs and outreach that PEP can also provide. I think uh, a lot of the speakers also talked about uh, insights into uh, newer and hidden communities as well. And I think uh, uh, from the USAID uh, presentation, we also learned that I think integration of services uh, is essential and the, and the whole person approach is going to be, I think, integral to us uh, being close to epidemic control uh, for HIV. So uh, I think uh, uh, with that, I'd like to again thank the speakers. Um, uh, thank you, Dr. Sunil and the Accelerate team for organizing this. Uh, we, this is possible again with the support of PEPFAR uh, and USAID. Uh, we are grateful to NACO, to SACS, uh, to our district teams, the facilities, uh, private providers, uh, and our community and CSO partners. So, and thank you to all of those who are attending this uh, webinar as well. And thank you for your feedback on the poll. Uh, we'll make sure that we get those invites out to the next uh, webinars as well. So uh, thank, thank you to everyone and uh, over to you, Jalpa. Thank you so much, Aditya, and thank you to all the speakers once again. And thank you, Sunil, so much for that exciting Q&A. I think with this, we'll end the meeting and uh, we will come back with the recordings of the meeting and the topics on the next webinar. Thank you, everyone. We're ending the poll now. If anybody wants to put in their feedback last minute. All right. Thank you, everyone.